Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. We'll talk to the director of Arizona's Medicaid program about Governor Ducey's plan to modernize Arizona's access program and a discussion about a film and art exhibition exploring the work of international photographer Pedro E. Guerrero. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thanks for joining us. Governor Doug Ducey announced a new program as part of the Arizona Health Care Cost Containment System, known as ACCESS. The new program is called ACCESS Care. Eligible members would make contributions to an account, similar to a health savings account, that could be used for services not currently covered by Medicaid, including vision and dental. Joining me now to talk about the program and other Medicaid-related topic is Tom Betlock, Director of ACCESS. Tom, welcome to Horizonte. Good evening. Uh, give us a, a, just a thumbnail sketch sure. of the history of ACCESS. I, I know Arizona was the pioneer mm -hmm. with ACCESS. A lot of other states now have it, but, but just tell us how it got started sure. and, and what it covers. Sure. So the ACCESS program was established in 1982. Arizona was the last state into the Medicaid system. So 17 years after the establishment of the Medicaid program, currently we provide coverage but for... But we, we decided to do it different than it yes, had been done Yes, without a that doubt. Time. So at that point in time, there were leaders that wanted to have a mandatory managed care program, meaning we would in essence contract with insurance companies who would work with providers and members and provide the services. And so we leveraged at that point in time a creative way to do that through what's known as an 1115 waiver. And the 1115 just simply references a federal section of law that provides the Secretary of Health and Human Services with some flexibility to allow states to do things different than what's required within regulation. And we're taking advantage of that again with Access Care. This is another creative attempt to deal with this issue. It is. So Access has evolved over time. We now provide coverage to 1.8 million Arizonans. It's the largest insurance program in the state of Arizona, about $11 billion a year, we provide coverage for about 50% of the births, two-thirds of the nursing facility days, and a lot of health care in between. And one of the changes we've seen in Medicaid has been the growth of the program, where historically it provided coverage for children, pregnant women, the elderly, and the disabled. And now 50% of the access population, because of program changes, um, is now between the ages of 19 and 64. So we've got a lot of adults in the program that historically were not covered by the ACCESS program. And one of those big program changes was occurred a couple of years ago when, when the governor proposed an expansion to take advantage of some provisions in federal law that allowed us to do that. Yeah, back in 2013, then Governor Brewer um, went to the legislature and said she wanted to restore coverage and then also expand coverage for the adult population. And so that started on January 1st, 2014. There's been some ongoing litigation around the legislation that created that restoration and expansion. Um, but since that point in time, since January 1st, 2014, we've had about 450,000 individuals come on to the ACCESS program. So we are now at that 1.8 million mark. And Access Care is, is designed to help people take advantage of some of these additional benefits? Yeah, Access Care is really, I think, the evolution of the, the Medicaid program, the Access program here in Arizona. So I mentioned now 50% of the population is between the ages of 19 and 64. And Access and Medicaid in general has done a good job in terms of creating programs for newborns where we try to reduce low birth weight babies and help moms with prenatal care. And we've done a lot in terms of the elderly and providing home and community-based services so that people don't have to go into nursing facilities. And now we need to really look at opportunities to create programs for, that ad for the adults in that 19 to 64 year old range and, and create some incentives. So one of the opportunities we're pursuing through the LM15 is to create the health savings account so that individuals that are contributing an amount, a small amount, 3% uh, of their income for a premium can use that funding for things like dental services and vision and other service that are not covered by the access program. Now this is a proposal, right? It is, You're yes. working on it right now, asking for comment? We are. We've had a number of public forums. We have a website, www.azaccess.gov, in which we're taking public comments from members, family members, providers, interested stakeholders in the community. We really want to see some public input on the proposal. We'll be submitting a formal package to the federal government, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on October 1st of 2015. And then we'll 
be negotiating that package over the next year. The, the waiver that we currently have, the 1115 waiver, expires on September 30th of 2016. So we need to get a new waiver in place on October 1st of 2016, and that will include pieces of the governor's package along with other items that we have before the public at this point in time. So you said you've been uh, holding hearings, you've been we getting have. comments and stuff. What are you hearing? What are, there, are there things that are of particular concern to the people that you've been hearing from? Well, we've heard a lot of people that support this package. Um, really, when you look at some of the other states that have expanded their Medicaid system, they've made the acknowledgement that we need to do more in terms of engaging the adult population. And so um, many, f many folks, many stakeholders have identified support of that. Um, as it relates to concerns, we've had some folks express concerns about some of the nominal co-pays and, and the premium dollars and whether or not individuals that are low income can afford that. But again, we're trying to create positive incentives where we want individuals to get preventative treatment. We want individuals to be able to connect to some of the infrastructure that's out there for job support and things like that. And then at the end of the day, we want to create these health savings accounts that individuals can use uh, to cover services and, and help reduce copay costs in the future. And part of the money they'll have for that is because they're saving on, on premium costs. And, and th that's their savings that they're putting into the program, exactly. So if we see this, it'll be about a year from now. Your predictions on, on whether we're gonna, it's going to happen? Well, we'll have a lot of discussions with the federal government, but I think the, the vast majority of what the governor has proposed will be in a final package. Tom Betlock, Director of Access, thank you for joining us on right. something. Thank you this. so much. Good to have you. Good to be here. The American Master Series and Latino Public Broadcasting's Voces Series join forces for the first time to explore the life and work of photographer Pedro E. Guerrero, a Mexican-American born and raised in Mesa, Arizona. Guerrero had an extraordinary international photography career. He was the personal photographer of famous architects such as Fla Frank Lloyd Wright and of renowned artists Alexander Calder and Louise Nevelson. There's also an exhibition here in the Valley where you can see his work. We'll talk about the film and exhibit in a moment, but first here is a look at a film clip from American Masters Pedro E. Guerrero, A Photographer's Journey. The minute I developed my first roll of film and made my first print, I thought, this is mine, this is for me. It was a magic that I could control, and I still feel that way. Guerrero had a real natural gift. I mean, how else could a 22-year-old start taking perhaps the most telling photographs that have ever been done of Wright's architecture? first job I had after I left school after two years was with the world's greatest architect. Pedro's photographs taught me who Frank Lloyd Wright was. He ran a photo lab in a small town called Cerignola, Italy, where they trained gunners to be cameramen. Pete was most certainly part of the what's now imagined as the glamorous Mad Men world of 1950s and 1960s. I worked for Vogue, I worked for Harper's Bazaar, I worked for a good housekeeping. Uh, almost every magazine that existed at the time. And it was, you know, it was glorious without much effort. My re recollections of Pedro was that he was more like Calder. He liked to enjoy himself, he liked to dance, he liked to be playful. It was chaos, it was a good word for it. But there was a, a uniformity to the chaos. He could see something and know how to photograph it. I walked into a world that was black on black on black. He got in there and got it somehow. I mean, that's the mystery of an artist. Joining me now to talk about the film and exhibition are Dixie Guerrero, the wife of Pedro Guerrero, Sarko Guerrero, nephew of Pedro Guerrero, and Tiffany Farrell, associate curator for the Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum. Thank you all for joining us to talk about the life of this, this extraordinary man. We've got a picture of the, of the, the um, shot promoting the film. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen right now. Um, and I think one of the things that this captures is how young he was right. 
when he met Frank Lloyd Wright. It's a fascinating story. Yeah, he was only 22 when he met Frank Lloyd Wright, and he, when he went up to uh, interview and to ask for a job, he had no idea who Frank Lloyd Wright even was, and he brought along a ridiculous um, group of samples to show him, uh, uh, you know, some nudes, uh, so a little girl and a dog at a beach, and you know, all and Wright went through them, each one, and uh, Pete said to him, I, "You can see I have a lot to learn." And Wright said, um, don't worry, I'll teach you. And, and it, was, it was happenstance in a way that he even did that. His father said, there's some crazy guy up in the right. mountains, you might want to go talk to him. Also happenstance that he became a photographer because he, he went to art school, the classes were full, so he switched to photography. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, he went intending to be a painter. Uh, and when he got there, all the classes were full. And he was in, in, they just said, well, he said, what else do you have? And they said, well, we've got photography. And he said, good, I'll take that. And, and uh, he said they were kind of shocked that he would just, you know, switch his, his idea of what he wanted to do. But he used to joke that he would have taken uh, embroidery if, as long as he didn't have to go back to Mesa. <laughs> so he ended up back in Mesa. Well, eventually, yes. Yeah. He was in he was in art school for two years, and then and then he went back home. Didn't go back to school the third year, and that's when his dad said, you know, there's this crazy old man out in the desert building a school, and maybe he he needs a photographer. And so they and they exchanged notes, and and uh, Pete did go up there, uh, and and meet with meet with Wright that day. Yeah. So Tiffany, it, it's somewhat. Uh, happenstance that, that the exhibition is coming out at the same time as, as the movie, but, but they are closely related. Some of the same pictures are in both of them, and, and we uh, have a, a, a shot of the exhibition information, um, and, and that's going to be running when? It starts September 11th? Yes, it starts this Friday, September 11th, and it runs through January 17th. And we have a, a number of the photos that are in the exhibition. We're going to just put them on the screen and, and, and uh, let our audience view them as we talk about them. But it, it does seem like, like it just really captures the full gamut of his life. I mean, there, there are pictures of, of the uh, interiors that he did later in his career. He, he really became, uh, there's a reference to Mad Men mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the clip that we saw, uh, a kind of a glamour photographer in, in that sense. Um, pictures, this one of, of him and his family, um, his father and, and, and his siblings, um, but also, the pictures of the artist, pictures of the uh, of Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, and, 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 and the pictures when he first went back to New York City, this is after the war, he's taking pictures and he eventually finds a job working for some of the prime magazines, Vogue and, and Vanity Fair and, and all the others at the time. It, it, it covers uh, just a tremendous arc of his life. How did you put this exhibition together? Well, it was very fortunate that we had a few friends that came to us and said that Dixie Guerrero was in town. And um, we were, they told us about uh, Pedro's work, and we were very excited. And we had focused on another artist, uh, Philip Curtis, and did like, a, like an Arizona legacy. And we kind of wanted to do the same thing with Pedro. We especially wanted to uh, focus on something that was more historical since we were focusing on current uh, Chicano art with focusing on Cheech Marin's collection. So when Pedro's exhibit came to us, um, and we worked very closely with Dixie, who was a wonderful resource. I mean, she's a living history of Pedro's <laughs> legacy. She houses his archive, and she also knows all the stories. And so she helped us in putting together the exhibition. And, and what will people be struck most by in, in, in the pictures? Is it, is it the architectural um, uh, scenes or the, the things with Calder and Nevelson? Well, I think the one thing that people are so focused on when you look at Pedro's work is the, the greats. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright, Alexander Calder, Louise Nevelson, the greats of the art world. And this way we're turning back the camera on him and focusing on other things that he was interested. And it, he also focused on candid moments of those great artists as well, showing pastoral scenes of them just hanging out with their family. or. Um, also, some just snapshots he did in New York. One of the awesome pieces that we have, too, is um, showing Julia Child's kitchen. Sure, that was a job he actually did, but you can see the care he took when he photographed uh, the works. And the stories behind them are wonderful, too, because it talks about how um, she invited him for dinner afterward, um, after photo shoot, the photo shoot. So there's a life beyond just the photos themselves. And Sadhguru, uh, we had the picture there of, of his family. We got another picture of, of you with mm -hmm. him. Um, what was your relationship with your uncle? 
Well, uh, I guess you could say he was a pivotal figure in my life uh, growing up. Uh, he was the example for me of someone uh, who left Mesa, ran away from Mesa, the discrimination that, that he grew up with and he wanted more out of life and he wanted to make something uh, of himself as an artist. So in a sense, uh, I followed him uh, both literally and metaphorically. I saw in him an example uh, of a man who grew up in a small town uh, with a lot of uh, discrimination and prejudice, yet he believed in himself and he believed he was going to uh, conquer the world through his art. And so it made it seem quite possible for me as a young man growing up in in Mesa that I could do the same thing. So as soon as I graduated from college, uh, excuse me, uh, from high school, I made a trip to New York and I went and stayed with my family, my Uncle Pedro's family. And I really got to see uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, his status as, as an artist, what he had accomplished. And uh, I wanted the same thing for myself. So throughout my life growing up uh, as, as, a, as a young artist, as, as a struggling artist, uh, he was always there to, uh, uh, not so much offer uh, direction, but uh, to criticize and to put things uh, in focus from his perspective. Although we weren't always on the same, uh, uh, didn't share the same uh, thought process, uh, everything I learned about his experience was valued, valuable to me as an artist. So Tiffany, one of the things that he was a critic of was the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, right. which had some consequences. Right, right, yeah. Even though he, he was a he was a veteran, he was he he served in during World War Two for four years. Um, so he was he was a very patriotic man, but the, he just couldn't see any sense in the Vietnam War, and so he would go on candlelight vigils and protest, and soon it it he eventually he got named to be on the draft board in uh, in Connecticut. And um, that raised all kinds of uh, attention uh, on him. And uh, the, the community was very Republican and very opposed to a, a well-known pacifist being on the draft board. They thought that what shouldn't happen. And, and Pete's point of view was like, well, we have pacifist senators, and we have all, why not have all points of view? Why, do, why is it only war hawks on the draft board? But eventually what happened was it became a front page story on the New York Times. The headline was a dove on the draft board. And that word got to the um, publishers and editors of House and Garden magazine, which was his major bread and butter account. And they put out the word that Pete was to have no more work. So that, that effectively ended about 80% of his career. Though and it also was the motivation to focus more on, on his work of uh, photographing famous personalities right. such as, as Calder and, Calder and, and Nevelson. Nevelson. But the thing about that work is that he, he, did, he never got paid for it. He did that just because he wanted to do it, and he thought it was an important thing to do. So Calder never paid him. Once in a while, if a magazine would use some of the work, then he would get paid that way. But mostly, all the work he did, he, he did primarily just because he wanted to do it. Same, same with Wright. Wright paid his expenses, but never paid him. So it, but, and he said, I think he says in the documentary at one time that some of his friends said, why don't, why don't you go out and do some commercial work? You could make so much money. And, but but he, this is something he just really wanted to do. And, and it's a good thing he did it, because now we have these records. And Tiffany, you commented on this a little bit earlier, but would you elaborate on, on the fact that uh, one of the observations is he was able to capture the personalities, not just uh, Calder and Nevelson, but, but Frank Lloyd Wright's made, made him seem um, uh, human in a way that, that other people couldn't capture. Absolutely. He was always known as Mr. Wright, even to Pedro. So um, he did capture more human sides of people. I mean, Calder was always personable, and uh, Louise Nelvison was just a character. And so he, you truly capture and you see that personality through his photographs. But even uh, uh, some of these projects enhanced his own techniques. I remember I, I've seen the film, and it talks about the fact how difficult it was to photograph her work because it was monochromatic. So he had to yes. come up with all kinds of innovative ways to light it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he learned under uh, Frank Lloyd Wright as well, learning design and lighting as well. And Frank Lloyd Wright had a certain way of liking his photographs for his architecture as well. So he had to learn a new technique probably with every time he photographed. Sarko, late in his life he came back to Arizona. Um, 
Uh, and, and this is somebody who'd been away, lived, uh, I mean, he'd been in Europe, he'd mm -hmm. been in New York City, he lived in, in uh, uh, New Canaan for, for a number of years. Um, uh, what brought him back? Well, I think he came back uh, at a time in his life when uh, his parents were, were still here, they were still alive, they were uh, in, in their 90s, and uh, as well as his brothers and sisters, who were uh, his, his brother, who was my father, was also aging, and... Uh, you know, he wanted to come back to his roots. He wanted to come back to Florence. Florence uh, is a place in our family that's very important. And uh, uh, my father was born in Florence. And so he came back, bought a home in Florence, and became very involved in what was going on mm -hmm. in Florence and became uh, a very uh, um, uh, vocal about the state of affairs here in Arizona, especially the affairs dealing with uh, border issues and uh, the same things that he ran away from were the same issues that were happening in Arizona, uh, primarily the discrimination and, and the prejudice and uh, the hateful legislation that was going on in Arizona. So just as he was vocal uh, uh, in, in his being against the Vietnam War, also he was very vocal and adamant in sharing his, uh, uh, his perspective on what was going on in Arizona, the politics. So, uh, Dixie, um, I can't imagine two places much different than Mesa and New Canaan. I mean, I've seen the pictures in, in the movie. So uh, was there an adjustment period? Oh, probably. There was probably some adjustment. But I, I, think, I think it was just, it was, it was a new start. And um, I, think, I think he was very glad, very glad to be. I, I think New Canaan was perfect for the time period he was there. It was, it was easy access to New York. It was a wonder play, wonderful place to raise his children. And, and, and to have his career, but you know, at this point in his life, I think he was ready to come back here and, and you know, get reacquainted with the family again, as Zarko said. So I, I, don't think, I, I, I don't think there was any sense of missing the big city necessarily. I think he, he, really, he really liked, he liked the, the small town feel of Florence. He was ready to come home. Yeah, he was ready to so, come home. So uh, we know about his photography. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think very many people know that he wrote three books. Yes, he did. He wrote three books. He's a, he was an excellent writer, an absolutely excellent writer. So he, his first book was Picturing Wright, and that was about his experiences with Frank Lloyd Wright. Then he wrote Calder at Home, and that was about his experiences with Calder. And then um, the, his last book was a, basically a photographic memoir. It was titled A Photographer's Journey, and that covered all aspects of his career with photographs. So, but yes, he's written three books. So, uh, Tiffany, how important is he in the pantheon of, of photographers, particularly architectural photographers? Oh, I think he's extremely important. I mean, he captured a time period where, you know, especially capturing Wright, you know, and he was actually the primary photographer for Wright. If it wasn't for Pedro, he wouldn't have a lot of the photographs we have of Wright's architecture. Just and and of the man himself. Well, and exactly. He, he got private access, access that normal people would not have gotten. And there's some striking uh, pictures in, in the movie um, of him capturing Wright in reflective moments, particularly at the Getty, which was the, uh, Wright's first major exhibition there. Right. And he captured a lot of these artists toward the end of their life as well. So, Sadako, uh, photography versus the kind of art you, you, you do, uh, was there an influence by your uncle on, on your artwork? You're, you're quite renowned in your own right. Well, my father uh, was a, a portrait painter. And so he was uh, uh, very, uh, you know, his main concern was capturing the likeness of an individual, capturing the soul of the individual in a charcoal drawing or in an oil painting. So you can see the same, the same thing going on with, uh, with Pedro Guerrero in, in his photography. When you look at his artwork, that's what you see. He captures the individual. He ca captures the, the spirit of the moment. And, of course, that's what I, I strive to attain myself, too. In, in the work that I do in my portraiture, in my mask making, my painting. Uh, I want to capture the, the, the humanity of the individual that I'm dealing with or capture the, capture the spirit of, of the moment. So, yeah, it was a very important uh, of, uh, helping me to see myself as an artist as well in his work. So, Dixie, he, he excelled at capturing, as Sarko indicated, uh, the, the humanity in, in people, the, the, the significance of, of buildings, uh, particularly the way he would photograph some of Frank Lloyd Wright's. Um, how well does the exhibition capture him? Oh, I think it's an excellent reflection on him. I mean, it's, for me, it's wonderful to see 
um, some of the other work that never has been seen. In fact, there, the photo of the, uh, the World War II photos, mm -hmm. these were a real revelation to me. I had never, I, I had focused on the right and the Calder stuff most of the time, so I'd never even looked at these things. And, and to, uh, many of them are in the documentary as well, and then there are several in, in the So it, it does him justice? Yes, yes. Well, oh, absolutely, idea. yes, yes. He would be very pleased by this, and especially to have it in his hometown. Well, it's a great exhibition. We're mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing it at the Mesa Art Museum. Thank you so much for joining us on Horizonte. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And that is our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte in Arizona PBS. Thanks for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.